It's Wednesday, May 29th, right now on 12 News at 10. A major airline is facing a lawsuit for racial discrimination. Tonight we speak with the passengers who filed that lawsuit. A nearly 30 year old cold case now closed in Scottsdale. The new twist of the woman on the run for decades. Inmates in Navajo County are finding purpose behind bars through a new program allowing them to care for neglected dogs waiting for adoption. Well, I'm a big animal lover, so this is definitely the best thing I could have done while being here. We are continuing with the hottest week of the year so far, and temperatures will climb even more by the weekend. 12 News at 10 with Mark Curtis and Caribe Devine starts now. We begin tonight with American Airlines now being accused of racial discrimination in a new lawsuit filed in federal court. Good evening and thanks so much for joining us for 12 News at 10. I'm Kariba Devine. I'm Mark Curtis. The lawsuit claims that airline employees removed all of the black men from a Phoenix flight after a worker complained about body odor. 12 News journalist Chase Go Lightly heard from some of those passengers tonight about what happened. He's live at Sky Harbor with the details. Chase. Mark Creepy, that civil litigation claims the incident happened back in January at Sky Harbor International Airport. Passengers were getting on a flight from Phoenix to New York, and part of the incident was caught on camera. This video captures the moments right after Emmanuel Jean Joseph, Alvin Jackson, and six other black men were kicked off an American Airlines flight right before the plane was about to take off. We're the only ones getting taken off the plane. They weren't given an explanation as to why right away, but when they kept asking... They told us that the reason that we were being put off the plane and rebooked was because of a body odor. That complaint coming from a white American Airlines flight attendant, according to this lawsuit filed against American Airlines, with Joseph Jackson and another passenger named as plaintiffs who believe they were removed because of the color of their skin. It was horrifying. The three men claim they don't know each other and weren't even sitting together. In the video, you can hear one of them tell an employee this is discrimination. with that worker not denying the allegation. I agree. The lawsuit then writes the men were told they would be rebooked on another flight. But when an airline representative learned there were actually no other flights that night to their destination, they were allowed to reboard, delaying their flight by an hour. It was horrible, honestly. It was everyone staring at me. Like, I felt like I was in prison. I was walking down and people were staring at me. They soon hired an attorney who is now suing American Airlines for racial discrimination. To try to influence American so that this thing, this kind of thing, doesn't happen to other African Americans or black people trying to fly in the future. Chase, it's 2024. I cannot believe that this happened. What did American Airlines have to say about the lawsuit? Mark, a spokesperson did send me a statement regarding the lawsuit. It says in part that they take all claims of discrimination very seriously. Their own workers are currently investigating this situation. We're live at Sky Harbor. Chase Golightly, 12 News. Chase, thanks. Traffic is flowing again tonight on the Loop 303 after a deadly crash this afternoon. DPS tells us it happened in the southbound lanes near Olive just before 5 o'clock. Officials say a car crossed all the lanes before slamming into a pole and bursting into flames. They have not released the identity of the victim. The crash did cause delays during the evening commute, but everything is now flowing normally. Meanwhile, developing tonight in Ahwatukee, police say that one teen is dead and another teen is in the hospital after being shot overnight. Officers were called to the area of 48th Street and Warner Road where they found the first teen. He was rushed to the hospital where he remains in critical condition. Nearby, officers found a car crashed into a tree and inside they found 17-year-old Malachi Henningham who had also been shot. He was pronounced dead at the scene. Anyone with information on this case is asked to call silent witness at 480 witness. Tonight, a nearly 30 year old cold case has been closed. Scottsdale detectives say a woman who had been on the run since causing a deadly crash back in 1994 had actually been dead for years and was living in Canada under a different name before she died. Now the brother of the woman who was killed is raising questions about how she was able to evade law enforcement even after she was arrested in Canada. 
12 News journalist Jonathan McCall is live at Scottsdale Police Headquarters tonight with how this 30-year-old cold case was finally solved. Jonathan? Yeah, Mark, lots of dots to connect in this case. It was back in 1994 when Gloria Schultz caused that crash that killed Angela Marr here in Scottsdale in Old Town. She then fled to Canada where authorities say she lived for decades, even being arrested in 2009 for another DUI. Tonight, Angela Marr's brother is trying to figure out how she was able to escape law enforcement in Canada. For nearly 30 years. Well, my initial reaction, frankly, was disbelief for spending so long. Dan Marr has been waiting on one call that would lead to justice in his sister Angela's death. In July 1994, Angela was killed in a car crash near Old Town Scottsdale. Investigators say that Gloria Schultz was high and drunk at the time. Charged with manslaughter and endangerment, she fled before the case went to trial. In 2001, Schultz was convicted on those charges in abstantia. For years, no one knew where she was. Optimistic that they'll find someone that'll turn her in or help them close the case. That's Angela's mom, Rose Marie, talking to 12 News about that case in 2018. She has since passed away. And I think every day my mother agonized over the situation and she was never ever the same person after my sister died. But now after nearly 30 years, the case is closed. Detectives say in 2019, Schultz died from cancer while living in a remote part of Canada under the name Kate Dooley. Police say an anonymous call that Schultz's brother received gave them the tip they needed. But get this, in 2009, Schultz was arrested by the Royal Canadian Mounted Police for a DUI. Marr questions why nothing was done then. You have to ask the question, why didn't the Canadian authorities say something to the American authorities? Maher says it was tough knowing Schultz lived without being brought to justice for Angela's death. On the other hand, um, you know, she still lived. She lived. Might have been, you know, a, a, a lesser existence than that she otherwise would have had. And she still lived. She didn't spend a day in jail. But it's a price he says she'll have to pay at some point. Mm. And Jonathan, do we know why there was a lack of communication when Schultz was arrested and fingerprinted back in 2009 in Canada for a DUI? That's a big question that we wanted to know as well, Karibe. We did reach out to the Royal Canadian Mounted Police today to get more specifics on their part of this investigation, on what they knew about Schultz at the time of that arrest and whether or not they uh, had any information about uh, what was happening here in Arizona at the time. Again, that's a question we asked them, and we'll continue to stay in contact with them until we're able to get more details about it. But for now, we're live tonight in Scottsdale. Jonathan McCall, 12 News. All right, Jonathan, thank you. Now to Pinal County, where crews continue to battle the Simmons fire just outside of Kearney. That's about an hour and a half southeast of Phoenix. It sparked last night, destroying two homes and burning 475 acres with no containment. Investigators are still working to figure out exactly what caused the fire to start in the first place. But at this point, the priority is making sure it doesn't get any closer to homes. Right now, about 300 people living in the Riverside area are under evacuation orders with even and more people on standby to evacuate just in case the fire moves closer. Meanwhile, the hot and dry weather is not making things any easier for firefighters. The temperatures start to rise and the, and the relative humidity goes down. That, that, that fire is going to start uh, waking up and uh, start making some movement. The closer I got to home, the closer it looked like it was right next to me. So, and it just ended up being in my backyard, basically. There is a shelter at Ray Elementary School in Kearney for anyone who has to evacuate their homes. Meteorologist Lindsay Riley joins us now with a first look at your forecast. Lindsay, the heat is on all across the valley and it doesn't show, unfortunately, any signs of letting up. No, in fact, it's only going to get hotter over the next couple days. And then late next week, we have some signs that we could be get into the 108 range. So right now, we should be at 99 degrees. We will be above that for the foreseeable future. Tomorrow, hitting 104 and then back up to 106 Friday and Saturday. And we'll be within that range Sunday through what next Wednesday. And then we could get even hotter late 
late next week. Even the high country seeing above average temperatures. 80s expected for about the next week around Flagstaff. 90s even closer to Sedona and upper 80s along the rim. And there is no rain in the forecast. It is going to be completely dry for at least the next week. Not just for Arizona, but for Utah, Nevada, and much of California. All the active weather is happening across North Texas, Oklahoma, all the way up toward Minnesota and even parts of Arkansas. This is the seven day precipitation outlook, and that's where we're going to have the most severe weather and the most rainfall over the next seven days. We're still at 92 right now after reaching a high of 103. Coming up in your full forecast, a closer look at those temps. Go send it back to you, Mark. Okay, Lens, thanks. Now to decision 2024 with Arizona's primary just two months away. Maricopa County elections officials staged a mock election today to put their poll workers and most importantly the equipment to the test. Newly purchased ballot printers had a good workout after printer failures in 2022 resulted in long lines. Maricopa County Elections Director Scott Jarrett said that part of that workout is to try to push the printers to their limit and test their capacity. So the mock election is more designed to mimic the real world environment where the stress test is an attempt to, tr attempt to find where they, the printers may fail. One thing voters should watch for in November, it'll be the longest ballot in almost 20 years. It'll be two pages with races on all four sides. The longer time required to fill it out could extend lines at voting centers. Still ahead, we'll break down.